Thank you very much, Louise. Let me start by linking today's events with what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, I've already voted. Uh, if you are going to know that you are going to be away uh, from your home on an election day in the UK, you can ask for a postal vote. So I actually voted about two or three weeks ago. In fact, uh, it is reported that the postal voting is at an all-time high, which is uh, uh, encouraging because most of the postal votes uh, will be for Remain. But my second point is don't ask me what is going to happen. I, I know no more than you do. Uh, but let me again try to link the, the events of today with the discussion we're going to have. Um, the support for, for Brexit uh, is in many ways a part of a worldwide political development uh, that is occurring in many countries, uh, not least in the USA as well. And this is that there is a populist, uh, nationalist, quite protectionist, anti-globalization and anti-elite feeling. This is, I think, connected with the fact that uh, during um, the last few decades, the working population, particularly the male working population, of most of our countries has had seen very little increase, if any, uh, in their real wages. And to some extent, they blame this on globalization, both on the movement of production offshore, particularly to Asian countries, and of immigration into the country, which they blame as taking jobs away from them and keeping their own wages down. And there is a feeling that those in charge, uh, the elite, uh, which includes not only politicians, but also central bankers, bankers, and economists, um, have been privy to encouraging a development uh, which has benefited them and the relatively wealthy and has harmed the relatively poor. And it was in some ways the bailout of the banking system after the financial crisis uh, that drove this feeling that the actions were taken to benefit those who were already in positions of wealth and power. It was not, I think, in my view, that the public actually wanted their banking and financial system to collapse. What really upset them was seeing the bankers uh, get away uh, with their very sizable pensions and indeed in many cases their payments and bonuses intact. <clears throat> Whereas the poorer people, those who borrowed and subprime, were kicked out of their houses on foreclosure. The real reason that we have gone from bailout to bail in is thus not, in my view, economic. Um, <clears throat> I could make a case that bailout was perhaps one of the most efficient economic responses that you could imagine uh, to the financial crisis. It was essentially political, that the, the political demonization uh, of the whole of the bailout exercise and of the, the bankers and of the, if you like, of the regulators who allowed and encouraged all this is part of this wider political scene. Um, nevertheless, and in part of all this, uh, the move from bailout to bail-in um, has a lot of very clear advantages. Um, by making the creditors uh, liable uh, for loss and for haircut, for bailing them in, um, it means that the creditors will monitor or should monitor uh, their banks better. I would, though, add very much my support to what uh, Arthur Silver said at the outset, 
that if you are going to be effectively making the creditors, uh, transforming them into equity holders after a bail-in approach, and making them subject to quite much more considerable loss, that excluding them from con governance control uh, is neither fair nor appropriate. So if we're going in f into a bail-in system, we ought simultaneously to be changing the governance system so that the bail inable creditors get part of the ability to control the governance of the bank, for example, through uh, AGMs, annual general meetings. If there's going to be better creditor monitoring, it should lower the level of moral hazard um, that it is believed follows uh, from bailout, that is believed, I think mistakenly, uh, that because bankers think that their banks are going to get bailed out, that they're prepared to take a higher level of risk. Bailout, will, uh, sorry, bail-in will certainly protect the taxpayer and in a sense therefore places the burden much more fairly. The taxpayers did not, played no role whatsoever uh, in the decisions that the banks took. Whereas the creditors took a positive choice to decide to buy uh, the bail inable debt of their bank. So overall, it is argued that it should improve the ex-ante behavior of bank management. Moreover, uh, in some of the weaker countries of the periphery of the European Union, there were problems in undertaking bailout anyhow because the sovereign wasn't strong enough, didn't have enough fiscal space to be able both to uh, meet the losses that the banks had racked up, uh, particularly on their real estate lending. Uh, at the extreme, this was the case in Iceland, but it also occurred in Ireland, uh, in Greece, in Cyprus, um, and to a lesser extent in Spain. So it mitigates the sovereign debt, bank debt doom loop. It is also argued um, that it removes the unfair advantage of the really big banks who are regarded as too big to fail. And it is certainly the case uh, that the really large banks have been able to borrow uh, in debt markets at a considerably lower rate uh, than the smaller banks, which can be let go. However, there has been some... Um, uh, research that argues that if you look at the difference between the borrowing rate of really big companies and small companies in any sector, in any industry, there is always an advantage to the big because their, their debt is much more liquid, much more regularly traded, um, and therefore it likely to have a, <coughs> a uh, a better liquidity premium uh, than the illiquid debt of the smaller banks. So it's not quite clear how large the unfair advantage is. But insofar as there was an advantage to the really big banks, uh, the move from bailout to bail-in should increase competition uh, from challenger banks. Moreover, uh, most of the uh, rescue exercises that were undertaken. Uh, for example, the takeover of Bear Stearns uh, by J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, the takeover uh, of HBOS, uh, Halifax Bank of Scotland, uh, by Lloyds in the UK. Most of the rescues and the bailouts were actually undertaken through mergers. And in many countries, in fact in most countries, now, including the United States, the banking business has become enormously more concentrated uh, into about not more than about four or five banks. And if you think of the US, Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, now, like many other countries, has something like 80 or more percent uh, of the banking business. And we sim not, simply cannot and competitive grounds uh, allow the banking system to become any more concentrated than it was. 
So there is no question that there are a lot of advantages uh, of moving from bailout to bail-in. There is, again, as I started by saying, I think the main incentive essentially was political. There was simply no political enthusiasm whatsoever uh, for continuing uh, with a bailout approach. But the grass is always greener on the other side, and the attempt to find an alternative in the form of bailing in a larger proportion of creditors is going to have its own complications. So the bail-in process may also have a number of disadvantages. One of the points to note at first is that the loss <coughs> to, be, <coughs> to be absorbed by somebody <coughs> um, <coughs> will, <coughs> will remain the same. The scale of loss will only change depending on the speed with which the bank is closed. The faster the bank is closed or put under new management and its business model changed, the <coughs> less the loss is likely to be. And I shall talk in a moment or two about what that differential speed may be. Now let us assume for the moment that the speed of closure and change of direction remains the same, whether we have bail-in or bail-out, then the loss is exactly the same in either case. But in bail-in, the loss will be much more concentrated. If you've got bail-out, the loss is shared, such as it is, between all taxpayers. They remember that the loss frequently at the end of the day is very, very much less than the amount that has to be injected into the bank to resolve it. Because when the bank is put back on its feet, eventually it gets sold back to the private sector. And it, when it gets sold back to the private sector, with luck, it can get sold back at a profit and the taxpayer will actually profit. So be very skeptical about the phrase of taxpayer burden. It's not always a burden. And the same, of course, is it, well. The same is not true of bailout because you've got to you've got to decide what to do. Sorry, bail in because you've got to decide what to do immediately, and that's going to cause really quite a large um, problem. Um, it's going to cause a large problem in many ways, particularly of valuation. What is the value of the loss? What is the value of the assets? We talk about banks being solvent, but we really don't know exactly what we mean because solvency is a matter of valuation. It's a matter of assets being greater than liabilities. That depends on how you value the assets and the liabilities. We don't have very good ways of doing that, particularly in the middle of a crisis. I had assumed that the way that bail-in was going to work would be that the resolution body, whichever it was, would send in a forensic auditor on the Friday evening after the bank was shut at the end of the week and had got into severe difficulties and needed resolution. And the forensic auditor would decide on the valuation over the weekend and come up with it on the Monday morning when the op main operating subsidiary under bail-in would reopen. That would cause very considerable problems. You're in the middle of a crisis. What is the valuation of the assets? The forensic auditor would be under extreme incentive to value those assets very low because there wouldn't be a chance for a second valuation. And if the, uh, if the forensic auditor got it wrong, then, the, if you like, the bank reopening or the operating subsidiary reopening on the Monday wouldn't then be properly capitalized. If the forensic auditor did have this incentive to value on the low side, what you would then have on the Monday morning would be an enormous differentiation between the value that the forensic auditor put on the bailed-in bank and its previous balance sheet. What would everyone else in the world think? 
for everyone else in the world sees that there is a huge drop from the bank's previous valuation to its current valuation, they would think, oh my God, what about my bank? Would it be the same? So there would be a huge move, there'd be a, a sort of pro-cyclical run by depositors out of deposits into cash and by the bail-inable creditors to hedge themselves. We saw a bit of that happening in January when there was a concern about Deutsche Bank's COCO, conditional convertible bond, when there was a concern that that might not pay any, any it, it, its interest, be able to do that. What then happens is that the bail-inable creditors in every other bank then hedge themselves by selling the equity, short-selling the equity in their own bank. The effect of that would be to drive down equity prices of banks in the country, particularly those most thought to be at risk, and of course to drive up the yields on any attempt to sell uh, bail-inable debt. Effectively, the banking system would become incapable uh, of selling either more equity or more bail-inable debt for what might be the foreseeable future. And that would, I think, in many cases, paralyze it. Moreover, of course, uh, those who are bailed in, the creditors, um, are concentrated. They're not, in many cases, and indeed they shouldn't be, uh, the general public, although there was a case where they were, as you well know, in Italy. Uh, who are they going to be, the bail-inable creditors? Well, they're going to be the pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, and the hedge funds. Now, do you really want to shift the burden of loss from the general taxpayer to the pensioners of a pension fund or to the people who have put their money with an insurance com um, company? If you don't want your pensioners and you don't want your insurance companies to be holding this asset because it's too risky for them to do so, then you are left with hedge funds and sovereign wealth funds, and I can tell you they will reach for their lawyers. And it will be enormously litigious. Uh, when this happened in Cyprus, um, I think that the number of legal cases certainly pretty much runs into three, three figures. Uh, for, as we establish a bail-in system of resolution, Tell your students, if you have students, to become bankruptcy lawyers. That is the way to um, a real comfortable uh, wealth and an enjoyable life from here on in. It is, it is going to be litigious to a degree, as it was in Iceland as well. I, I was an expert witness in one of them in Iceland. And the whole process is, I think, going to be slower and more expensive. However, let me go back to it. As I said, I thought that the valuation was going to be done over a weekend. Perhaps because of the difficulties of doing that, which I was suggesting, uh, there has now been a paper produced by the man in charge at the Bank of England called Andrew Gracie, which was published in May this year, saying that actually the valuation isn't going to take place for quite a long time. For months, perhaps. But then what's the value of anything? And what do the creditors do? And if you, people have to realize assets because they get divorced or they die or, one, or they want to involve themselves in, in a merger process or whatever. But they won't, they're at, they, won't, they won't have a valuation. And if nobody knows what the value of these assets are going to be, the world is going to be plunged, or rather the financial sector of the country in which Bailin is taking place, is going to be plunged into enormous uncertainty. And what's going to happen in terms of the governance? And who governs? Because you don't know who actually owns the equity when you haven't got the Bailin sort of introduced on a fairly immediate basis. Well, actually, the authorities will put in a temporary governance system, but eventually it will have to shift. And the governance system under bail-in process is going to be dodgier, because remember, the people who are going to hold this stuff 
the bail-inable debt, are going to be quite largely hedge funds. Now, do you really want a group of hedge funds running your insurance company, your, your, your banks? Remember in Cyprus, uh, bail-in was done because the people they thought were going to, um, uh, to be hit were the Russians. Well, do you want your Russians to run the Cypriot banks? Actually, I'm told they're not doing a bad job. Um, that the Russians are being more helpful in running the Cypriot banks after Berlin than had been thought. But it's likely to lead to a deterioration of governance. We had this process of Berlin with a co-op bank in the UK. And again, the hedge funds were running it. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily a good idea to transform or shift the, the running of a bank to a group of hedge funds. Now, all of this have inevitably as you add risk to bail in debt, is going to involve a higher funding cost to banks. And the higher funding cost will involve a worse outlook for bank borrowers. So you're, you're shifting to a system which is going to have uh, higher costs, more worse governance, greater li litigation. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, there's also going to be a much greater need for liquidity injections. Don't assume that the state is not going to get involved. There was a very interesting article quite recently about the aftermath of continental Illinois. The main drain of deposits occurred after continental Illinois was bailed out, not before. Imagine the scene. You've got Bank Majestic, or whatever you like to call it, and... Over the weekend, the holding company of Bank Majestic gets effectively dissolved, but Bank Majestic operating subsidiary continues. Now, that is going to be blazoned all over the headlines. Now, if you are a big depositor, say you are a mutual fund or something, do you then want to tell your board that you are still depositing with Bank Majestic? after Bank Majestic's sort of reputation has been put through the, the grinder? And the answer is no. So that come the following week, even when the operating subsidiary has been recapitalized by the bail-in creditors being required to put in equity funding, shift from uh, debt funding to equity funding, its, its name will have been damaged badly and there will still be a deposit run and the central bank will have to, in effect, put money in to offset the deposit run. So bailout leads to public sector money being put in to recapitalize the bank. Bail-in will lead to central bank liquidity funding to offset the continuing deposit run which will occur after the bail-in system has occurred. The amount of money going from the state to the bank will probably increase after bail-in. It will just occur via the central bank and not via the Ministry of Finance. So there are a lot of problems, I think, in ex-post outcomes. Bail-in will work splendidly if the bank getting into difficulties is an idiosyncratic bank which is way out on a limb, totally different from every other bank, if you can see that it's a bank all on its own. But if a bank collapses, as is normal, because it's th at the worst end of a spectrum, in a systemic crisis for which all other banks are also damaged to some extent, more or less, I think that bail-in is going to be very, very dubious in terms of its operation. Um, and I understand why the authorities went down this route. As with Basel II, I prayed that it would be enough. It wasn't. I pray that bail-in will help us through another systemic crisis but my intellect tells me it won't work in a systemic crisis. Thank you.